Bit of citizen comment. Any citizen wishing to render comment, please step forward to the podium on our left and your right and render comment. There being nobody in the council chambers as a citizen tonight, it looks like we've satisfied this element of the agenda. Next item on the agenda is approval of the September 20, 2016 Planning Commission meeting minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve? I'll move to approve the minutes. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion or proposals to revise the minutes? There being none, all in favor of the motion to approve, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed, raise your hand and say nay. Any abstentions, raise your hand. There being none, the motion carries, the minutes are approved. Next item on the agenda is the housing strategy plan. I invite to the council table, the presentation table, the city staff and their consultants. Good evening, Planning Commission. Um, I think you've all had the opportunity to meet uh, your new planning commission compadre, uh, Scott McDonald, and uh, Scott very graciously came into City Hall at six o'clock, so he's already put an hour in tonight, I have to say. All right. Um, Laurie and I gave him an orientation, and he, we finished before seven, so he did have the opportunity to run away, and, but no, he decided to stay. <laughs> Um, so Scott is uh, f filling the vacancy left by Commissioner Shrebnik. So Scott's term will be through December 2017. So um, welcome, Scott, to the, to the Planning Commission. Thank you. Bl glad to be here. If I could add a few words. I've known Scott for many years. His, his children played Little League with my children. He's lived in Kenmore for a long time. He's an accomplished attorney, and he's volunteered elsewhere in the city on many many projects, so we're lucky to have them. Thanks, Scott. Thank sure you. he'll be an asset. All right. So um, we are continuing the discussion of the housing strategy, and I believe that the, the last meeting you got through um, the regulatory approach is under Section 1. And so um, Arthur and Mike with Arch are here tonight to continue that discussion, and I don't know if you approach will be the same as last time, whether your idea of looking at the strategy as if it was intriguing, it um, stayed on the list. So we are fine with continuing that approach if that works moving forward this evening. So um, Doug, if it's okay, I'd like to kind of turn this over to Arthur to continue that discussion. Yeah, that sounds good, unless there are any questions from, I know we had a couple commissioners out last time, you guys, if you've looked it over and want to. I, I do have to say that you all did a fabulous job of focusing on so much material and making it, you know, little bites so that we can move forward. So I really appreciate your work, Arthur, and the commissioners that were here. Thank you, Carol. All right, with that, Arthur, the floor is yours. So the, the screen, just, sorry, so okay. the screen's coming up if you, and we will pull up the, the matrix so you can either view that on the screen. So if you want to do that, raise your screen so you can actually look at that either on, the, on your paper copy or <laughs> on, the, on the screen, whichever is more comfortable. I have to buy readers so I can. Oh, oh, oh read yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. Okay, so just as a quick refresher, um, what we've been doing is walking through and sort of letting you ask questions and make comments about the different strategies. We have not updated any of the stuff from the last conversation, but I will note that just so that you're aware that we remembered that, um, like for example, we will come back uh, after we get through the list once and we will sort of incorporate your comments I think we said that we were looking for sort of categories of, um, we had those blank columns off to the right where that might help give you some sort of summary guidance. And so a couple, and as we listen to you, we're sort of trying to come up with the ideas that might help identify those columns. Um, so some of may be like timeliness, I think is something we talked a little bit about. Like if you're already working on some initiative in the city that that strategy would link up with and we would note that. Um, another one is sort of almost a flip of that is, well, we just did something recently, 
So make notes of that, and that might be more on the watch list for a second go, you know, when we go come later in a few years, but at this time it's probably more of a monitor and watch rather than need to take action because you took a similar action in the past. Um, so we will c continue based on your comments to look for other ideas along those lines. Um, and, but uh, we did get through the first section, so now I think the intent is, I think that was probably a more challenging section because the issues were kind of all over the map and very different. Um, I think you'll see that we get more sort of patterns now as we go through the next couple sections and hopefully we can get through a lot of the uh, matrix and get that initial. And again, what we're looking for is comments, clarifying questions. Um, I've got my pros and cons notes, so I'll have those at your disposal at the ready if you have questions and stuff. Um, so, but I think it's mostly for you to have the point to clarify questions, make your obs, um, and then also make observations and insights that you have on any of those. Okay. Yeah, and if I could add, as uh, I think Debbie said last week, we sort of established the the kind of level, the threshold of interest that we're looking for tonight. In other words, these proposals we're not confirming that we want to propose them to the city council yet. It's preliminary. And uh, we described, Lori described, our threshold is whether we are intrigued by the proposal enough to give it further review later. So we've called it the intriguing threshold. If you don't think it's such a good idea, you're not intrigued by it, just say so. When I you know, take kind of a poll after we've talked about it, if you do think it's worth further exploration and are intrigued, then just say so. And the majority of commissioners voting on that as intriguing, we'll put it on the list as Arthur suggested. Go ahead. Okay. So the next section is, again, these are in the regulatory field, but they're now focusing more on persons that may have special needs. And generally what we mean when we say special needs is that it is not just sort of standard housing, but there might be some level of services um, that go with that. So um, I think we put sort of stuff for senior housing where they have supplemental services, um, also things like group homes and things along those lines are what these generally fall into. Um, so um, the first one is uh, to have develop, ensure development regulations address housing accessibility. Um, this is sort of a idea comment that um, is to sort of look at do you create housing that have accessibility features. Um, and that can actually be on a building level or more of a, even a neighborhood level sometimes. Um, and the idea there is to allow people to be able to stay in their housing because they have features or it's laid out in ways that allow them to um, stay in their homes and, and be able to uh, stay in their homes. So that could be, um, you do see some level of requirements in multifamily housing these, you know, for some time now. You have to have a certain number of units that are adaptable or accessible. Um, accessible. Um, and that all depends on the layout of the building. Um, and so these are generally intended sort of to make it easier for people to be able to stay in their housing. Um, sort of more on the con side, doesn't directly translate to affordability per se, um, unless you look at the point of view that people can stay in their homes and don't have to, aren't necessarily forced to move and things along those lines. Another potential con is does it increase development costs for builders depending on what kind of features that you're, you're looking for. Um, and then again, the third is there is a certain level of federal I mean, sort of requirements under the building code as it stands at this point. Okay. Questions? Comments? No? When he, Arthur, you referred to federal standards under the building code, but the first thing I thought it was the Americans with Disabilities Act, which already imposes, I think. Right, that's, that's, that's for what public. But I think, are those, do those apply to Private residences? I thought those were just for public accommodations. There is certain levels of requirements even for private housing. It's generally when it's multifamily housing. Um, of over, I don't know if the minimum threshold is it 10 units? That might be the minimum threshold. I don't know exactly the minimum. Mm -hmm. And then it also depends on if a build, you know, the, the floors or how many is also impacted by whether or not you have floors accessible by elevator. So that will affect how much you have to do. But so that is in the building code for multifamily as well. Okay, so you're proposing um, regulations that require builders to go beyond the ADA. Um, that's how that would potentially be interpreted, that's right. To look for other ways besides what's under the code 
to increase accessibility within housing. And that's, so, that's why I'm saying sometimes people look at that sometimes as, um, you know, do you require sidewalks when you, in a neighborhood so that you have a better sidewalk system in your community? Uh, yeah. So here's my, I mean, obviously this is, there's social value in creating accessibility for people to get to and from their residences. But our project is to focus on ways to make housing more affordable. And as you said, Arthur, this, this is an extra cost. So it would have the opposite effect. <coughs> so if our project was let's find ways to improve the lives of people with disabilities, they'd say absolutely. But if our project as it is, is to make housing more affordable, I, I'm not sure this is the way to go for that purpose. Not that I oppose the concept. But we, we do have the ADA they've got to uh, deal with and adding more things to that uh, would make it less affordable, not more affordable. So that's my concern. Anybody else? Scott? Yeah, I, can you give me an example of uh, something? You, you mentioned sidewalks, but that's a public uh, domain rather than the, the mm -hmm. a residence in a, you know, a, a 10 unit uh, apartment building. Mm -hmm. So what, what would this uh, pertain to as an example uh, for a 10 unit apartment? So um, for example of something that makes a home more accessible, um, whether or not it would fall under this category completely is the type of flooring materials used. I know when we used to do senior housing, we would make sure we did either hardwood floor, you know, solid surface versus if you had a longer ply carpeting, that can make it difficult for people in wheelchairs to utilize um, that, kind of, that kind of space. So that's an example of things that the former developer we used to do. Um, but that's sort of an example. I mean, could you formulate this as a, a cost-saving measure at the same time? I mean, shag carpet is probably more expensive than the, the, the right. short that's, stuff. Right. I think that's where some would are. Some would say some of them are more cost-neutral, and some ideas may be less cost-neutral. Um, so I think that would be a consideration is, is there a cost implication, you know, you brought up is there a cost implication. Um, again, this is, this is an area that I haven't done a lot of work on in the past. I just know that we see groups in the community that increasingly are saying as our population ages, are there things we can be doing um, in order to increase accessibility. Sometimes it's helping, you know, in single family homes, how you do layout, do you have bedrooms on the ground floor? I mean, it can be things along those lines too, just sort of how homes are designed and things. Anybody else? Or Scott, did you want to add anything? No, I think that okay. answered my question. All right, so where do people feel, how do people feel about whether this is, meets the intriguing threshold? Is it something we want to explore more? Well, I, you know, my thought on that is that if it could be done in a economic, uh, economically, you know, manner, then I, you could consider it. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if there's something beyond the ADA that that, that is a good idea. I mean, okay. Sounds like you, it's enough for you to want to explore more. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Anybody else? I feel like the for me the devil's in the details. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I'm not sure I want to rule it out, but I'm kind of skeptical that it's going to help make it affordable. It's feeling like a middle of the road one. No, for me it's unlikely. It's like, unlikely. <laughs> I would be okay. willing to call it intriguing enough to explore, but I'm skeptical that it's right. going to help affordability. Mike, uh, I think I'm in the same place you are, Doug. I, I'm interested in hearing more about this, but I don't see enough specifics here for me to really say I, to intrigue me yeah. or to make any kind of opinion. Yeah. So I, I okay. want to have this flushed out a bit more before I. Okay. okay. All right. We'll try to get some more better examples of where that's been done. Okay. Thanks, Arthur. So that's what I meant by middle of middle of the road. It wasn't intriguing, but it wasn't clearly off. Oh. That's is that the middle? I, I, <laughs> intriguing is the high end? <laughs> yeah. so. Well, intriguing means at least it's on the upper yeah, part. I, I, I see where you're coming from. Okay. Uh, yeah, please, Mike. Just a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, instance where either a developer or an uh, individual uh, 
made structural changes to their house to make it more accessible, for instance, for mm -hmm. uh, handicapped person, right. handicapped people, or maybe for seniors. How does that get traded in that their tax assessment? Uh, does that have an impact on the value of the property? And would that have perhaps an unintended consequence of increasing the, the cost to the owner? Well, um, the way you just said that at the end, if an existing homeowner does a remodel, it's probably the rules of any remodel. The assessor will, you get a grace period, and then they, if they see a remodel over a certain amount, then they will do a reassessment. Um, and they will look at the scope of the permit in making that determination. So whether or not those trigger that, you know, depending on how much you do, whether or not it triggers that type of reassessment process. So those sort of structural changes would not be treated any differently than, the, than a standard remodel for change? No, not that I know of. I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Is my understanding is the assessment looks for permit records to know whether or not they should be doing a special reassessment rather than just, you know, sort of the inflationary. And it, Having I, gone through that myself. So. <laughs> so a new versus a remodel situation, a new development okay. with, oh, versus a remodel would be treated the same way. That's a question. So um, if a developer came in and said, right. I was going to develop a, a right. property specifically to allow this sort of access, I'm going to have wider corridors, right. I'm going to add elevators, whatever else. That's going to add X cost. That wouldn't be right. treated any differently than any other design considerations. Well, when, when we look at assessment records, they do quality of construction, whether or not that would trigger the excellent versus very good or very good versus good. Um, my guess is other elements of the design build as much into that as anything. Um, generally, newer stuff, they give a higher level, but you can definitely see new construction, they do put different quality on them. But I'm not sure this is the level of deep what, what they look for when they're making that assessment. Yeah, from my experience in real estate, they don't look at much detail. They look at square footage, they look at neighborhood, they look at comps. They don't look inside the house. Um, a lot of times they don't follow up on permits even when they've expanded livable square footed, square feet. If you look on the assessor's records, you might be surprised at how small your house is uh, if you've done any additions to it. Uh, they're supposed to, as Arthur said, but a lot of times they miss it. So I. My hunch is they w it wouldn't have a big impact on That's it. pretty much what I assume, but yeah. I, I wanted to make sure I understood That's a good that question. there wasn't a, yeah. a different treatment, yeah. at mm -hmm. least today. Lori. Um, I'm thinking of, of this one, and I'm wondering if just this could be valuable informationally. <laughs> like some of the things, the carpet in the hallway, I'm thinking of grab bars in the shower, I'm thinking of a bedroom on the first floor. Those are things that people may not even think of as they're, you know, considering a new home or working in a new development. And, and I'm not sure development regs, we ha I agree that we need more information, but maybe just um, providing those thoughts or those concepts you Two you need, developers do you would have be useful. To the internet right now? Um, well, possibly. <laughs> if you do, go to our website because I almost said what you said, but I was going to wait till we got down to the education sections or the informational. Is that might be another approach on this? Is providing information, and our website. We worked with several senior boards from different cities in East King County, and we have an entire section of our website on exactly what you just talked about. What do seniors do for housing options? And one whole section is, um, one whole section is on how do you adapt your home to be able to stay in your home and the kind of things you can do and resources on how to think about what you can do to your house so that you can stay in it. I am aware up in Snohomish County that there are several incentives for large tract developers to put in some housing that would attract senior, seniors and, you know, they're spec homes, so they probably have a family package or an ADA package that they can put in there. But uh, my, when my son bought out there, he had a neighbor that moved in who was in his late 70s purposely moving into this neighborhood because 
some of the homes were planned for that. And that, that's, that may be at the sort of having sound. I know for a while Redmond was pushing, build some of the homes with ground floor bedrooms. Yeah. Don't do everything, you know, if you have two stories, do some of them so that you have that kind of access. So that's where, um, and they were thinking of incorporating regulations of that effect in a subdivision that you had to have X percent with at least, a, you know, with uh, units on the ground floor. They were thinking, I don't think they ever incorporated that, but that was something they were like looking at. So one of my concerns is, well, we, if we, if the city adopted these regulations, would builders be required to make accessibility features in a house where most of the market isn't interested in or finds it kind of in the way? I mean, let's say you have a house and they have, you have to put a ramp, you know, and to get into a door instead of stairs and mm -hmm. somebody decides, you know, that's not my preference. Mm -hmm. I don't need the ramp. Now I've got to remove the ramp or, um, you know, the builders thinking, well, the vast majority of the potential buyers don't want the ramp, but I got to put in a ramp right. and I got to add to my price mm -hmm. for this ramp. Right. So yep. it's, a, it's an awkward thing because of course we want people to have access to their, right. to their houses and seniors, but if it's across the board, isn't it a little broader than it has to be, Lori? I, I think that's what I was trying to get at. I mean, I think there's a spectrum here with this concept so that it doesn't have to be development regulations. Maybe it's something much less than that. Okay. It's an informational piece, as Arthur is pointing okay. out. Uh, I'm just saying that the, I'm not sure that the idea itself is without merit. It may be how far you want to take the idea. I see. So, so what we'll try to do on this one is come back and try to give you some examples um, do a little bit of research, see if we can find examples of where communities have done it like in buildings, in neighborhoods, as sort of mandates so that you can see what those look, you know, so we can give you a little more of those who have done it kind of where it's played out. And then you can make the judgment calls it education or some of this worthwhile thinking about it harder in terms of something more. Is okay. that, would that be helpful? Yeah, I think I like what Lori said there. I didn't, in fact, I'm glad we talked a little more. I didn't understand exactly until then what and, Larry was getting at. And as we go through this, I'm kind of getting the feeling that there'll be more detail as we go through this next section. But um, as we prioritize according to how intriguing it is, mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep in mind that we do ha already have people with these special needs that live in our community and that's probably going to grow. But as a city government, we don't mandate for those things to happen but we certainly can incentivize so that potential builders or remodelers would consider our area as a place that would be welcoming to that. Okay. I don't know how we do that, but I don't think it's the top priority, but I can see where, I do know that there are communities out in the Skagit Valley too who have specifically created neighborhoods for group homes and senior living and but they've incentivized that for the builders so they're more new construction and it is affordable of course when you live that far away from downtown Seattle <laughs> and the land is less expensive you can do it but there's got to be some creative ways that we could acknowledge that that's a need but you know how we move forward with it might be a priority that's down the list a little ways okay so we'll have information that sounds like a good segue to B and C. And I'm going to sort of do B and C together because there is a lot of overlap between those two. Um, this is now where you're sort of talking about specific types of buildings that are geared specifically to um, seniors and or persons with special needs. So as you can see, you have under B, we have group homes. Um, and then you even have provisions related to shared housing and or rooming or boarding houses. And then under the seniors, you do have adult family homes. So those are all sort of three things, areas that probably raise a lot of the same kinds of questions because they're often located in single family neighborhoods. Um, they're sometimes seen as 
oversized single, you know, depending on how they're designed. Sometimes if they get built as what they are, you know, what they want to be, they, they will maximize that envelope. And many cities write the envelopes for single family neighborhoods to be somewhat generous, knowing that most homes are capped by the market or the market does it. But, um, but that can be one of, you know, for all of these, that can be the issue. One of the issues is the neighborhood compatibility question. Um, the flip side is I have increasingly heard over the last few years about how group living can help create an incredibly affordable form of housing for people that if it works for them. Um, and it started with adult family homes for seniors and that's been around for probably 15 years now. It's just sort of taken off pretty significantly. But we're doing that now for some homeless populations where they'll get three or four people together and they'll have a housekeeper, you know, so someone who's there and they will live and it creates a very, very affordable form of housing. Um, you're not in Bothell where I'll be next Tuesday night, but you have the whole university young people phenomenon um, where that played out in the way in Bellevue in a neighborhood where somebody was buying homes as investments and sort of abusing the remodel allowance, you know, how big an envelope you can do and created a living environment that felt like it was going beyond the line. I mean, we'll be talking about ADUs in a little bit. Um, ADUs is meant to really fit in, but here's where you're, you know, you're keeping the primary owner in the property. Here is where it's the different feel. Um, sometimes a complaint I've heard over the years is that it's allowing, you know, some people in neighborhoods consider it a business more than they consider it a living environment. Um, I think the people living in the group homes, I don't know if they would say that, but I'm just sort of putting out the things I've heard over the years. Um, so anyway, I think, let's see if I've hit on the different, um, now to some extent, you have a legal requirement under the Fair Housing Act to, and ge generally the word is reasonable accommodation is the legal term that's out there. Um, that communities must allow in some form for this to occur. So if you're, you don't necessarily have to change your zoning rules explicitly, but you then have to have provisions to do reasonable accommodation. If someone walks in the door and says they want to do uh, a group home, that you must find ways to accommodate. So I think most cities that we see have done that. I'm not exactly sure how Kenmore has handled that. Um, you know, different cities have... Some have just made it outright allowed. Others have had included the reasonable accommodation provision. So as a first step, you almost need to legally make sure you meet the minimum standard. The, then the second question is, to what extent are you just trying to meet the minimum standard versus do you are these things that you see have value and that you are looking for other um, types of things that can be done to allow or in, encourage those different kinds of forms of group living? Why is a, an adult family home not allowed already? It's just a form of residential right. use, it, isn't it? It is allowed. Right, that's the, what I'm saying. Yeah. So, well, I thought, and I didn't know there was any restriction on it. I thought this is where seniors, no. unrelated <coughs> seniors would go to live and they might share some of the, the uh, living assistance costs, like, like you said, a housekeeper, or maybe there's a well, nurse or something. The, the, there are state uh, requirements related to adult family homes for the uh, six or fewer uh, seniors living in a home with supportive care. So those regulations, and, and there aren't any really any city regulations other than the standard single family rules, um, those regulations are already in place for that type of an adult family home. So what are we proposing that changes this? Are we allowing Bigger so, envelopes. So, so keep in mind that no, not necessarily. What we're saying here is we've got the full list here. This may be the example of we feel pretty well covered because, you know, the only you might want to, is there any need to review to see if there's been any experience in the community. But this is one that might be a lower rung because you've got provisions now. Okay, I've been doing this a long time, and when I first started doing this, a lot of cities didn't have the reasonable accommodation or didn't allow. That's what I'm saying. For a lot of the cities, you're to a point where. And um, so this is one, again, I've got three different examples here, and we might say, okay, that one's simple. We can put that one sort of in that category. I just thought it would be helpful to talk about all three types at one time rather than have the same conversation okay. over and over. 
Mike. Um, under B, uh, point two uh, and point one, mm -hmm. the uh, including rooming and boarding houses, that seems to me to be very different from. Right. So I, I would feel very differently about, about one okay. and two uh, if we broke out rooming and boarding houses into a separate section. Okay. I think right. this gets what you were talking about yes. earlier. We've got a housing accommodation versus maybe a commercial enterprise. And right. And, and so that, what, I, right, what I'm saying is I just thought there's enough overlap on what the issues are that I just thought let's have one conversation around all three. I think what, what Lori's saying is for C, which is adult family homes essentially, that one, fair housing, you've got stuff on the books, that's, and that might be the answer there, and that's what we can report is, yes, you're covered. One and two, I'm saying from a housing point of view have a lot of similarities, but they are treated differently legally. And so now these other questions come up. And so, right, so I'm looking for reaction to the subtle, to the difference between these two different forms of housing. I, I think you're, you're hearing that. I think the rooming and, rooting and boarding houses uh, have a different character, certainly have a potentially different impact if, it, if they were located in single family neighborhoods. Uh, to me, it's a very different situation. But we already have that going on because we do have a university in the city. And I would venture to say that there are a number of homes up in the Inglewood Hills area that do rent out rooms to right. students. So it's kind of like a boarding house, but I don't even know if the owners of those properties live in those homes, but they might have a designated you know, resident director or whatever who supervises the government of the home or whatever. But, you know, does the city have any thing against allowing homeowners to do that? So I think you've, you've maybe put it out there in a good way um, yeah. or, or a way to think about this, which is people renting their houses out happens. Mm -hmm. okay? It's probably, I don't know, it might be as between 5 and 10% of homes are rented out, have been for a long time. And generally they're rented out to somebody who may even take some roommates with them or not, um, but it's done in a way where it's in the community, it's been in the community, and it's not much of an issue, and so what's going on is okay. Um, the reason why I've been a little sensitized to it is, is that um, on two levels, one is situations where students, and it was being done in a way where it felt like, a, I mean, it was still housing for six people, but instead of it being the house rented and six people got together and rented it, it was six individuals renting different rooms in the house. Mm -hmm. So all separately and not necessarily as a household. So, you know, I don't know if any of you at some point in your life rented a house with two or three other people, you know, when you were fresh out of college or when you were in college. I mean, it's fairly common. This was where they were renting individual rooms and so all of a sudden, it felt different and they were experiencing them. If you're not, then maybe there's not an issue per se here. The other scenario is we are seeing this, this is now more of also an anticipated type question, which is we are seeing besides adult family homes for seniors, we are seeing a similar situation arise where it may be homeless who are, you know, it's, it's, there is a staff person there or developmentally disabled. We've been doing it for developmentally disabled people for years. We've helped several groups buy that, and, um, buy homes, and they do have a staff person who's there, and then they have people with developmental disabilities living in those homes. Again, kind of protected under the adult family home provisions um, kind of thing. So, you know, I'm sort of raising it, do you see it as an issue or does it seem to be self-managing itself that it's a watch issue now and not enough of an issue for your community? I think in Bothell, we might find it's more of an issue sure. um, than it is, I don't know. So that's why I'm sort of putting that question out there. But so I, the best but approach might just be keep, just keep watching and it's not. It's probably not a real high priority for Kenmore in my limited view of the city at this point in time. but. When you look at the homeless issues in Seattle, and you also couple that with the neglect of mental health accessibility, one of the creative ideas to be able to solve those problems might be expanding accessible group home living situations. 
So I don't know really what that means. I just know in my own thinking that could be a possibility because we are relatively more affordable to purchase homes in Kenmore than, say, Kirkland or Redmond or, or you know. Virtually every other city in the Arch and, Network. Right, right. And so, you know, and we're a smaller city, so I think it's okay to pay attention to this. I don't know that it's a real high priority at this point. We've not had some government agency coming to us and saying, hey, you guys are on the rapid transit line, and within a mile of, you know, Botha Way, you have maybe something we could do with transitional housing for this element of people who need care and we don't have an ability to find housing for them in the city of Seattle. That's a different problem than, you know, university students getting together and renting a house while they're going through school. Anybody else? Mark? I want to clarify, do we know how many group homes or adult family homes there are in Kenmore? I mean, are they are they licensed? Um, are licensed. They have to Mike's going to answer your question. <laughs> so this is in the housing needs analysis we gave you a couple months ago. There is a some statistics on the senior and adult family homes. So, so yeah, as 2013, there were 21 adult licensed adult family homes and two licensed adult living facilities. So combined between those 23 facilities, there were over 200 um, beds, people okay. accommodated there. Okay. Anybody else? I, I, I'm just thinking one of the concerns here, I guess, would be if you got an animal house uh, <laughs> on the corner and, and the neighbors are going crazy and they and then they qualify as a you know group home. And I, I mean, I I would think that Bothell might have a situation like that or the U District, but but we don't have that. Probably wouldn't have that problem here. And I guess right. Right. does that come up in well, discussing this type of issue? Well, I think when you have that, you have nuisance laws, okay? So if there's an issue there, noise or whatever. Um, but what's, what's your standard, six? Eight, I think it's eight. Eight city. I think it's eight unrelated individuals. So under the, you can't prevent up to eight unrelated individuals from living together. And what law is that? Is that a uh, fair housing? Fair housing. Fair housing. Fair well, that's, I mean. I think it's federal. Uh, yeah. That was one of the first issues we dealt with with a lot of cities is sort of, you may want to keep it at four or five or six, but you sort of have this requirement, you sort of need to do that. There's a, uh, it's, it's messy. Uh, <laughs> it's got it. I've had to deal with this in my practice a little bit, but they do square footage, number of people, you know, bedrooms have to be a certain size if you want to have more than a, you can limit the number of people, but you have to be sensitive to how big your unit is. But apart, assuming a, a unit is a minimum amount of square footage, I think federal law requires landlords to allow up to eight unrelated people. Okay. So the commissioner's Baker's sort of perspective, her angle on it seemed to work as a way to note the situation? Um, I, I don't see where we're adding to what we already have. I'm not sure. Right. It's another one of these, it sounds very vague. It's not mm -hmm. a bad idea. We already allow well, right. adult family homes. We already allow, federal mm -hmm. law requires up to eight unrelated people. Right. So I'm not sure what else we're looking for. <laughs> you could have rooming Part houses. Of this is you live in the community, if you're not sensing that yeah. this issue, you know, like you're saying, if you're not sensing it's an issue, that's a good filter to say, do we want to look at it harder or not? And that's what I'm saying is, I, was, I, I didn't list everything because I thought you had to do all these things. Yeah. I gave you sort of the comprehensive list and we can move on, we can move, you know, if that's, that's what I'm saying. If her way of putting it makes sense to you, then we can move on and move on to other top and other areas. I, I gotta admit, I'm not exactly sure where you were on the intriguing threshold. My, my feeling is I would rather put our time towards other right. propositions. And, and that's what I one. think I heard you say is, is the way I noted it is okay to pay attention, but don't see it as a priority at this time. Don't see it as a priority unless 
And the outcome of King County helping Seattle deal with their homeless situation begins to impact Kenmore. Right, that's what I'm saying. At this, and it will, mm -hmm. but at this particular time, it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm with that. Okay. Okay. Now, the next, the next D and E are related, but they are different. Okay. Um, D is a is a strategy intended for all multifamily properties. I think in some cities I might say have built with more than four units sometimes um, that says if somebody has what is, well, there's two ways. We worded it the way it had been worded until the last year or so, which is there's a federal program called Section 8 or the Housing Voucher Program in which a person is given a voucher, that's what they refer to it as, and they go out on the open market and they are trying to find people who will rent them an apartment and if and the way it works is they're told how much they can pay for rent um, and then what they do and let's say that's a thousand dollars a month what the federal government says is you will pay one-third of your income towards that thousand dollars a month so if they're only making a thousand a month and they pay three hundred and thirty three and the balance is paid through the ho local housing authority for the balance of the owner still gets the thousand dollars a month so the idea behind this is that there are landlords who say, I don't want to participate. Just because you, know, you have a voucher, I don't want to consider you. Um, and so the question is that um, does, does the city, there's been attempts to have state legislation. The state legislation has not adopted such legislation. Um, several other cities in, in King, King County, Seattle, Bellevue, Redmond, and Kirkland have all adopted this ordinance. Um, Seattle is taking it further. They have called it source of income. So they can, you can't say you're getting Social Security disability benefits. You can't say no because of that. You know, they're saying, look at, you know, if you have, a, if the person has a way to pay the rent that you're charging, then you can't use the, the source of income they're using to pay for it as your discrimination. Now, if you have other screening criteria, you're still allowed to use those. If your rent is $1,500 a month and they can only pay 1000 you don't have to lower your rent. But it does say that if they have their income from whatever source, be it assistance or their own income to pay, then you can't discriminate. So like what some landlords have done is they say, you must have three times the rent level of income and they won't count the, you know, so one way around is they, hey, you only have $1,000 of income and the rent's 1000 you don't have three times. So therefore, we're not going to rent to you. Um, so that's sort of how it plays out. Um, the pros are when you look at vouchers and people who have them and they're available throughout King County through the King County Housing Authority, they are disproportionately located in South King County where rents are lower. Um, and that landlords in East King County have, we went through a very, very strange experience about four years ago in Redmond, which is why Redmond adopted their ordinance. There was a landlord who had national company. They had 15, 20, 15 or more people in one of their larger properties with vouchers, and they gave them a notice saying, you can't stay. They'd all been good residents. I talked to the, national, the regional property management company, and they said it's because the national company decided they didn't want to take vouchers anymore. There's nothing about the people here or anything along those lines. That same company had properties in Bellevue and in Redmond. Bellevue, they had people with vouchers. It's fine. We know. we got to do it. But Redmond, we don't, so we're not going to. Uh, and so they were going to evict 15 households from their housing because they decided they changed their policy on management. On the flip side, the private sector says this is a voluntary program. Why should we be forced to do something that's a voluntary program? Uh, they sometimes state that they say there's extra administration. We have to meet. We have to have an inspection done. It can take time to fill the units. You know, those are the arguments we hear from the builders on the other side. So that's what that issue is, okay? Um, so that, I'll put that out there, see what questions and comments you have. And, and I, I'm just going to start by, by getting some clarification. Are you yes. just proposing to limit this, quote, anti-discrimination proposal to vouchers or to, as Seattle has, all sorts of income? That would be something you guys could clarify. I'm just letting you know that okay. since this first came up, 
They've now expanded it to these other forms of assistance that people get. Um, the city, the ones that are written in East King County, I think are all referenced just to vouchers uh -huh. because we did it more than a few years ago. Okay. Um, kind of thing. So that's, again, that's out there right. for your discussion. Uh, comments, commissioners, vice chair? I just want to clarify another one. Um, so you said there's no state uh, legislation on this, and there's no federal uh, laws that cover this particular? Correct. Okay. I got a question. Uh, you said that there's more inspection requirements, and uh, where does that come from, and, and how onerous are they? Well, the Housing Authority will claim that it's just reasonable condition of units. Um, kind of thing. So they do, they have a process they use. Our King County Housing Authority suppose has a good reputation of doing them very quickly. So the Housing Authority does the inspection and then if there's anything in there they list what they are and the person cannot you take their voucher and move into the unit prior to those repairs being done. Now, an owner can say I don't want to do the repairs. I mean the owner still has the right to say I'm not going to do the repairs and then they won't be able to move in. So there's ways around, I mean there's still ways that some builders or owners can get around the basic provisions, but, um, and that's why at times I never, for a long time I didn't push it an issue because I figured there's other ways to game this that p builders have used. But when we saw what happened in Redmond with this national company and the fact that they were, they didn't mind the program when they were in one city if it was required, um, that to me sort of made it, put it on people's radar and let you have that conversation. So. Um, they do have to, they have an additional lease writer that has to be signed. So they have to be annual leases. So again, if you do it, now you don't, again, you don't have to force, that's another way you can get around it. You can do month to month leases only. Section 8 requires the first year must be a full year lease. Um, once you do the first year, it can go to month to month. But in that first year, it has to be a full year lease. But again, um, if the owner offers that to other units, then the sort of the logic is then you should offer it for the vouchers. Um, so there are, sometimes you get in the details, but the owner still has a number of rates, but there are, there is a different process because you're going to get a lot of your rental revenue from a third party, which is the housing authority via the federal government. And I believe those payments are made directly from the housing authority to the, to the landlord, okay, so that they know they'll get their payments. Is it motivation because they feel that there might be more drug activity, uh, for, for example? Is, is that a reason? And well, um, when they're in front of the legislators, you don't hear that. But when we hear them talking, they sometimes do claim that they think the profile of the residents will be more troublesome. Um, but in fact, the state just passed a law um, to create a fund for repairs made, you know, just to try to help maybe be the bridge the gap to get some state legislation passed. They just this year created, uh, they're creating, it hasn't been set up yet, a fund that landlords can apply to have reimbursements for any damage done to units from voucher holders. If they can document that it's above wear and tear and things like that. So the state just did pass legislation to set that up and um, they're working on that. But um, again, that property that I was referring to, I talked to the property manager, I said, are they problems, any of the residents? They said, no. And if you think about it, especially in this part of the county, um, you still have to abide by the lease provisions, you know, you, you know, so you still have to be a good, good tenant, um, however that's defined. So, um, you know, you have to still follow whatever standards are in the leases of the market rate units, you still have to follow those as well. Anybody else? Carol? Currently, does ARCH try to advocate for cities to accept this voucher program, have a certain percentage of the housing for low-income housing be participating in a Section 8 voucher? You're on to number E. Oh, sorry. That's okay. That's an okay. interesting question that we have that or, or E is a, is a wrinkle on that idea. Right. Um, we have, when we have funded affordable housing, the Housing Authority has at times allowed us to put vouchers into buildings. Um, so we'll have like 10% of the units that we've assisted through our programs. 
um, that the cities have assisted, where some of them will then be vouchers, which makes them that much more affordable, because your income can be down to zero, and you can still afford to be in that unit, um, because that's one where most of our stuff that we fund, we set the rents at a certain level at you know at 30 percent or 50 percent of median, and, and that owner needs that rental income somehow. So if you can get something, so the person living there needs to make 30, 50, 60, 80 percent of median, um, or close to it, so they can afford the rent. But the voucher, the landlord knows they'll get their 50, 60, 80 percent, whatever that rent is. But the resident, if they lose a job or if they're not employed at the moment, they can still be in the home, and it, and it covers their expense. So, in fact, the number one priority of ARCH for the first 20 years of our existence is there has been in this country, there's two different kinds of Section 8. I described the vouchers where you go out onto the open market. The other kind is when they're put into a building. And in the 80s, they went to the private sector and they asked private developers to build whole buildings that were prime, almost all Section 8, you know, voucher-based or the same kind of program, but with a 20-year contract. And after 20 years, those owners were allowed to convert it to market-rate housing. We have spent a lot of money and a lot of energy, and it was the number one priority of the cities to not lose that housing. Because it's been in their community for 20 years. They saw that it worked, that it was fine. And, um, and it's been our number one priority, and we have preserved almost 600 units through, you know, to keep that same kind of program, but when it's in a building, to keep that building, to keep that program in place. So we have a lot of different kinds of experience with those kind of programs that have worked fine and haven't seen neg any kind of, you know, negative impacts on the community. Anybody else? So. I, can I just, okay. again, I think this is one of those areas that is very sensitive, but because we are wanting to be a city that we, t you know, we're a pass-through city, we have a highway running through our city, and we want to attract rapid transit, we're, we're going to be asked to participate in the future as a city in helping to ease the housing issues that already exist, but they're mainly in downtown Seattle. And, you know, we can not pay attention to this at this time and focus more on the senior housing, And but I think it's important to take some time to at least have our city council be educated on what the trends are. And for, you know, a smaller city like we are, what, what should we be planning for? So I'm going to go back to sort of reminder mode here, too, um, and also point out of the buildings we have preserved that had this kind of federal assistance, over a third are seniors. And in the voucher program, many of the people with vouchers are seniors. It's not just for families. Um, it's for all types of households and people with disabilities. So. Just point out that it's a program for a wide range of different needs in the community. Now, the other thing as a reminder here is we're not asking you to decide, yep, we want to pass this, res um, we want to pass this. It's, is this an important enough topic given the needs in your community that this is something that should be looked at sooner than later as a strategy to be explored to see whether or not you do, do want to actually adopt? I, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. So you said a handful of cities, Seattle, Bellevue, Redmond, Kirkland, I think that was it. And King County. And King County, a county. So that's unincorporated King County. Have adopted this anti-discrimination law. So it's one of the many lists, you know, the protected classes. And if somebody feels that they're being discriminated against because they receive a Section 8 housing voucher and they didn't get a house right. or, or a mm -hmm. rental they could file a civil right lawsuit against the landlord for this discrimination, just as if it were racial or age or gender. Or no, it's kind they, of thing. they actually file through the city. It's it's because it's not you don't make it fair. You can't change the federal fair housing categories. It's a city requirement. But cities have their own list of protected correct. classes. Yeah, they, they, yes, they, yes, like exactly. Yes. Categories. So it becomes like a yes. Right. So That's this correct. would be one of the categories that a correct. city would make a, mm -hmm. a protected class. is right. what they call it against discrimination. So 
you had said that there that the other cities I guess other cities have considered this besides the four that have adopted it is that right I'm not sure I can't say that I have the same list as going to other cities as you know over, over this course of this year yeah I'm not sure because as I said for a long time I didn't bring it up per se because I just saw so many ways around the rules and we were hoping the state legislation would pass it. Mm -hmm. So why do it in every city? If the state legislation passes it, then it's taken care of. Um, so for all those reasons, I don't, I don't think, you know, Bellevue did it when I first showed up here because Bellevue was doing lots of things. Um, right. It's one of those things when you get proactive, it has a tendency to come up. Uh, Redmond and Kirkland came up because they saw some behavior in their communities that got called to their attention. Um, well, you, you mentioned one national apartment. Right. I'm saying owner, a similar circumstance. I'm saying is we there was some there was a period of time where some of that was occurring that cities decided it was time to, to not, not not let right. that happen in their community. So this is an area where it looks on its face like why would anybody object to this? Mm -hmm. Why would any landlord say no to a tenant right. who now has a better capability of paying rent? And it leads me to think there's more to this because on its face why would like I said it seems pretty obvious to have this kind of a law in fact it makes me wonder why would you need this kind of a law <laughs> because landlords would be happy to get a guaranteed source of rent right um, you and you had said it's been before the state legislature and they've said no mm -hmm. why would they say no private property. what were the other objections right. I think you said there was a burden on landlords it created right. extra administrative burdens. Is that was that the sole objection to this? The landlords have been very vehemently opposed to this legislation because we, uh, most. I think the reasons I can furnish you the letter they provided to Redmond, mm -hmm. if you're curious in seeing it, so that I'm not speaking for them. Sure. Um, and if I can furnish, I think I well, can find I mean, that. Well, but they've been before the state, mm -hmm. not just Redmond. Right, well, I'm saying so I, I'm saying the arguments they made in Redmond are the arguments they okay. make at, to everywhere they go. I'd like to see it. Okay, because there's more to this I, than I meets think, the eye. And I'll, I'll tell you it's something. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, good idea to get to see the list because, mm -hmm. like I, you know, this is like a no-brainer that's not being accepted for a reason. Right. And I, I'd like to know the reason. And I will say, in my my law practice, I I can give you some what I think are some reasons mm -hmm. from client landlord clients who have talked to me about this. Right. And one of the things you mentioned that they have brought up is this addendum to the lease mm -hmm. that Section 8 requires. Right. So the landlord has a lease, so mm -hmm. hands it to the tenant. Tenant says, hey, I qualified for a Section 8 voucher. You know, they can pay 50% of my rent directly to you, and I'll pay the other 50%. You have to agree to this addendum to the lease. This is what Section 8 requires of right. every landlord that participates in this program. Right. So you said so now the landlord's got to amend his or her lease now they got to take on what section 8 wants in their lease not just what they want in their lease and I think one of the things in their lease are as you said annual inspections mm -hmm. Is that right so section 8 sends somebody out there every year and they inspect the property and then that's somebody they, they go well this is wrong we want this fixed we want that fixed and some of these things I think go above and beyond the housing code the building code. I'm, I'm just telling you what I've heard. I'm not sure it's no, accurate, I'm, I'm, but I'm, so right. there are some landlords I've heard object to that. Right. Now I've got this laundry list of new things I've got to do and that I otherwise didn't have to do. They the don't other, have to ahead. do those things though. Sorry? They don't have to do those well, things. Well, this is, I've heard differently. So right. the so other anyway, thing so I've right. heard about this addendum is that the, that Section 8 then sets any increase in the rent. They approve of it. Mm -hmm. And I think the language is in there that, that it's going to be a market rate. It has to be a market rate. But I've heard landlords complain, no, they don't necessarily, their version of market rate isn't my version of market mm -hmm. rate. Right. I'm happy to charge. I can't all, you know, it's silly for me to charge so, something other, higher than market rate, because I wouldn't fill the unit. Mm -hmm. But now I've got to get their approval before I can change the rent amounts. So that, so I've heard another objection to this. After the year lease, yeah. you can go to month to month, and if you want to raise your rent to $500, then that person will have to move. If, if I think Section 8 thinks that's a legitimate or a market rent increase, if you, if you say, I want to raise the rent from 1000 to 2000 and Section 8 says, no, we think the market for your unit is 1500 you can't raise it to 2000 But you know what I'd like to do is see, in addition to that letter, I'd like to see what Section 8 requires in that addendum. 
It's a standard form, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I've heard landlords say, well, I, I replied to Section 8, and I said, well, Ken, I'm happy to take your Section 8 tenant. I have no objection to a tenant paying me with Section 8 money. But mm -hmm. um, I'd like to modify this addendum. I'd like to, I'll take this, but I, I don't want this. And Section 8 has said, take it. You can't, you don't get to choose. You have to take this. Right. And then I've heard my clients say, well, I, I told them, I, then I'm not going to take the tenant. And then I've, they've said to me, well, then they got sued for discrimination against Section 8 voucher recipients. And, okay, and so what, yes, that can. Sued by no. the Department of and, Civil Rights well, in it, Seattle. And right. it's like, I'm not, I'm not objecting right. to the voucher. I'm and, objecting to this addendum and all these extra rules so, I now have to set it. So, I will say from the experience of talking to our cities along those lines yeah. that people will try to use that and more times than not the city will back up the landlord. The they city will, will back up the landlord and I've, by no, saying these, these that, are that brought when by someone is rejected they weren't rejected. Well, I'm talking about when people are rejected for a unit they say oh I had a voucher. They find that more times than not that the landlord rejected for legitimate reasons. Right. And the city will say, no, you don't have a case. That's if there are other reasons. So I'm just looking solely at the voucher and the addendum. So and I, th I think can you I want finish? to help us move along, right? Right. So you have some information. I'd like to get that. And then you can continue. I think the, I think the issues have been put on the table for you to weigh, and we'll try to summarize, and we'll get you information. One other uh, issue possibly is in a, a lawful detainer situation, the Section 8 person says they did an inspection and said that the, you know, there was ants running around, and uh, so that's something that right. he can fight so, the unlawful right. detainer on. What I would be cautious of us doing in this setting is negotiate what we think makes it right or wrong. It's is this issue important enough that we should put it on the strategy plan? Because I think we're starting to get in stuff that. The people who say why the need is there you should be hearing from and the people who say it's a concern you should be hearing from. I don't mind providing information we've had from previous. But again, we're not asking you to decide. We're asking you should this be, is this important enough for the city to weigh in on, you know, or put it on the back burner, side burner. Okay. So I just want to also keep that in mind. I know it's a fascinating conversation. Um, but we're trying to go through a whole big list and the idea is which are the things that we should be looking at first in greater detail. And we're now getting in the kind of weeds where I've watched this debate for 15 years now, and I don't want to be the filter for that. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be happy to furnish you the information from a recent episode of a city considering it. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> so I was curious um, if what kind of evidence or data we have on how many, uh, how often vouchers are used in, in Kenmore. Um, okay rental housing and what, if any, evidence there is of current discrimination within Kenmore and how that may stack up relative to other okay. East King County cities. I don't know if that data okay. is we, available. We, but we have that information. Okay. So we'll bring you the information on voucher use in Kenmore and how that compares to other cities. Right. And, and discrimination, too. I mean, that's what okay. we're trying to address. Well, I mean, I don't, point, I don't know it's how hard for us to assess that for your community because you don't have any provisions. Um, so we don't have any provisions against it, right? In other words, there's no ability right. for right. someone to complain in Kenmore about the issue. So that's why I gave you the example I said in Redmond. We watched several companies blatantly change their policy. I mean, we just watched it happen overnight when all of a sudden rent started going up a lot, or I can't remember what was going on at the time, and they just said, you know, and sometimes I. Builders want their buildings as clear and unfettered as possible when they want to sell them. Clear and unfettered? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, so now we're still on vouchers. If All we right. have to move to the next one. All right. This is now when you are creating some affordability because often the dilemma in East King County is the challenge with using vouchers is market rents are higher. Because, yes, they have their own definition. It's called FMR uh, per Section 8. And that FMR can be lower. Now, the King County Housing Authority has changed their rules to allow people to pay more rent in parts of East, in most of East King County. 
But what this is saying is, hey, you've used your land use rules to create some units like it's 70 percent of median income. That is under the FMR rent level. Maybe we should have a provision that says for those units, um, in fact, I think we actually kind of do that in our agreements now. We say when we do assistance, um, when we do funding assistance, we say you can't discriminate against voucher holders. You could even go a further step and say we want you to work with the housing authority. Okay, so that's taking it. I'm just sort of putting out there the range of steps. So that's what this one is about, it's saying we've created product in our community <coughs> that is restricted um, and then say we could further restrict it by saying have some of those be available for vouchers or at a minimum not discriminate for those units. Comments? I yes, Karen. A, you know, yes. one thing I do appreciate about Kenmore is our proximity to have some affordable housing and be able to still get to work, you know, for the people that are out here. We do have some privately funded housing available for people in transition who would qualify under, I think, this affordable housing crunch or need. Um, and we also participate, have a Hope Link facility here in Kenmore, which I think is really amazing that our city has that. Um, I think as we move into the affordable housing section, it would be very helpful from you, Arthur, to give us some data and, and maybe percentages of what other cities' targets are so that, you know, our city's going to keep growing. We do want to encourage new building. I, I, I heard a rumor that there's going to be a memorial Lori Anderson extravaganza over the park and ride facility. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. But, you know, we have opportunities, I think. The key is we have opportunities to look at these, you know, strategies and be intrigued with things we can actually do here in Kenmore that will prove that we are being proactive and thinking about these things and kind of ward it off at the pass. We can't do anything about accelerated market expenses. That's just going to happen. But we can do things that encourage there to be more housing available. And I think that's what this next section will help us do. Okay, um, more on this, or are we ready to move to the next? Um, we're on E, right? We are on E. Okay, I don't, we haven't finished that. So, E, comments, intriguing, not intriguing? I can, I'll just speak for me. I, this is kind of close, so closely related to D. If I have my concerns about D, I guess I'm going to have the same <laughs> concerns about E, so I'm sort of waiting to see. Okay. We asked you for some things on D. I guess it makes sense to see that before I um, can really evaluate E. So that's me. Anybody else? Mike? This is another one where I'd like to see more specifics. I think the information you've asked for would be helpful. Yep. Uh, not that I think this is true, but when I think about a worst case scenario, what comes to my mind is we know that Kenmore over the next few years, three to five years, is going to be in a major redevelopment mode. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of older property, particularly single family and other property that's going to be redeveloped to something over the next three to five years. If I were a developer out there, I wonder to what extent would D or E limit my ability uh, or flexibility in redeveloping in a short period of time, one or two years. That worries me. Uh, the concern that I think you raised, uh, Doug, about do we end up with, through the different definition of uh, disagreement about fair market pricing is, or fair market, do we end up by actually backing ourselves into a rent control situation? Uh, which again leads us back into how do we redevelop our housing stock uh, as we go forward if, if we've got a locked in price. So that my fears may be totally unfounded, but I'd like to have some information to help me dispel that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? 
Move on. Okay. Sure. I'm just writing down stuff. <coughs> Take don't. your time. <clears throat> okay. So now we're on to the affordable housing section. Now, this is one in which the first one, um, we've got one large category with different types of subcategories of different incentives. So I think, um, you know, I think we can talk about them at once, but we'll also ask for perspectives on the different ones. Um, and these are all things in which you already have some experience in your community with doing. So you'll notice we did use the word expand it's rather than to do. Um, so the first thing to make sure we all acknowledge is there's this, you have been doing this um, in some areas. You have, you, have this, you still have the citywide voluntary approach out in there on the, on the books technically, but probably where it's most likely to occur is in your um, downtown overlay area because it was more explicitly designed. Your citywide one was inherited from some county code language that existed in the county code, so it was really geared towards county type of land development. So um, you and about three or four other cities I work for all have that la same language because you all incorporated at about the same time, and I'm not sure I've ever seen those provisions used not only in your town, but in others. So I think we're really talking more about what you designed specifically for your community. So that would be number I, which is density, you know, you can call them bonuses, which are mandatory or voluntary. Um, right now, yours is designed to be voluntary if you use extra density. Um, that's a little different than what Redmond did. With their, they allowed the extra height, and they don't care if you use it or not, and they're gonna get a certain percentage to be affordable. Um, you have some very creative wrinkles where you based it on how much of an increase, so you tried to correlate the value of, the, of what you're giving to the level of affordability, and um, you included a provision that capped it at 10% of the units rather than just keep increasing the percentage. That was based as much with me putting, sort of was trying to accomplish two things. One, I had heard from the private sector at the time you were doing that, that especially in higher density areas that they're investing from a long-term point of view and that same comment I made earlier about having as few a units with a restriction on them is more desirable, that, that it's better to have fewer units probably that are restricted than just keep adding more and more at the same affordability level. So your provision sort of goes up at like 70% of median you, depending on the bonus and then once you go beyond that threshold, you start flipping units to more affordable. And that was in responsive to the community group who worked on it, realizing that you had needs at lower levels, but you needed to give a whole lot more in order for that to work. So yours is a very interestingly designed program that is related to how much bonus you get, caps it at 10%, and then starts, has opportunities for some of those units to be even more, that 10% to be more affordable, depending on high up of an increase of, of density they get. And it's all sort of based on the trade-off of increased land value against the impact on long-term value of the rental unit. So um, you have that now implemented. Um, you know, it's relatively new. We haven't seen any buildings explicitly um, do it. Probably the other example you have in your town is before you incorporated Lake Point, Lake Point, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. Had a development agreement through the county that has an affordability requirement similar to what I've administered for other master developments in other parts of King County. The notorious P suffix. The no yes. Okay, the P suffix, okay. Lori's nodding. Right, so <laughs> those are examples. Mike remembers this. Right. <laughs> so so this. the range of options. I'll tell you what it is. For you to sort of think about under this first one is do you change any of the provisions on what you have now? Do you maybe flip some of that to mandatory or do you keep it the way it is? Or are there other areas of the community that you'd like to, ex are there other areas of the community sort of where you're maybe thinking of zoning changes where that might make sense to consider something similar? So those, and I'm not, I guess I turn to Lori and 
um, and Debbie to say, are there areas, you know, I think Lake Point's kind of hanging <coughs> out there um, because that will be re-examined. I'm sure the whole thing is being re-examined. Should that be something that, you know, is there a timeliness there because I potentially relates to like that development? So are there any existing, and then maybe there's other scenarios that are out there that are worth thinking about. But that's what the first one is about. Um, the second one, I think we talked about the last one, which is the parking standards, and you do have the right to do studies. So I think we already concluded on that one that we're probably good for now. So we, you know, I think on that one we'd say the last conversation implied you've got some provisions now, so that's probably worth putting on the side burner or whatever and watching. And then the third one is, um, um, and I actually didn't put MFTE here. Um, because I think that's under the direct assistance group, grouping, but they're sometimes linked together. So the third one is sometimes cities have actually um, combined different incentives to get better affordability. Kirkland did that. They combined MFTE with land use to get the affordability levels down on, you know, instead of getting 10 at 70 percent, they get 10 percent at 50 percent of median because they got two incentives. So those are the range of things in this category. I was going to say that MFTE is multifamily tax oh, exemption. Thank you. Good. You needed Thank to know you. that. And um, the program that Arthur has been talking about is the Transit Oriented Development District. Uh, the Planning Commission worked on that geographic area, um, but this could be something that could be looked at for other parts of the downtown. Comments? You're saying that you we don't have any history here on what's going on if it's working or not or well the rules were passed uh, a year ago and So no, we don't have any developments in in play. It's a voluntary program So a developer can either develop under the existing rules or develop under the TOD overlay TOD transit oriented development overlay rules uh, we've had an inquiry in the last month about that, so I, I don't know. I, I no. mean, we just haven't had the track record. It's new. The, the property across the street um, is an early version of that. I mean, that was a site that was rezoned many, many years ago, and they do have, what percentage are they at? Um, I think it's 25%. They have 25%, but they also have MF, they did get the multifamily tax exemption plus sort of the rezone you know, the zoning that was done. So that's one example. What we, f there are several cities in East King County um, that have similar provisions as your TOD. Um, Bell Red and Bellevue, Overlake and downtown Redmond. Actually, Redmond has it in most neighborhoods now. Redmond has it all over the city. Kirkland has it in a number of neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, Newcastle has it in their town center. Area Sammamish has it in their town center and Issaquah has it in its town center. And what we often find is plans are done before the market's ready in general. So Redmond, for example, um, all developments there have 10% affordable at moderate income. And we saw nothing for five years. But if you've driven to downtown Redmond recently, I don't know, Mike, can you say off the top of your head how many Affordable units are now in downtown Redmond. Yeah. I put him on the spot like that. He, he does all the agreements and contracts with the builders there. But every one of those buildings that you see, downtown Redmond now has a set aside for affordable units. Um, Newcastle has how many developments? Three. Three. They didn't have anything for about three, four years, you know, after they passed their plans. Um, Sammamish now has three, three developments. Um, again, their plan was passed four, four, five, four years ago. Probably right when the recession started. So between real estate cycles and sometimes plans are ahead of their times. Um, but we have seen in the last year or two, we have definitely seen with the overall market, because most of the units are still market rate units, um, we have seen a significant amount of development where they have set asides for units that are targeted to certain income levels. Carol, you had your hand up. Um, so as we think about this, I'm highly intrigued by this, by the way. I think it's something that our council should take a look at and think about strategizing in detail 
how to incentivize development so that we can meet the affordable housing needs that are coming. But I don't think that's easy to figure out. That's why we need you. <laughs> but I, I'm intrigued, and I'd like to see this be something that's elevated on the recommendations to council. Thanks, Carol. Anybody? Well, Go ahead, I, I just, I mean, we don't even know if what, what, what you, we just did is going to work. I mean, is there any evidence that it won't work? You, what we've got passed a year ago? That's why I think why I gave you the example to sort of say, theoretically, your program seems as, I've worked on all of the ones I described to you. When I walked out the door on yours, I didn't feel any different than the ones I walked out on the doors in the other cities. Is and that, Is that good? Hmm? How'd you feel? I felt, I felt like it might take time, but it felt fair. Okay. I, I look for fairness. I mean, it, there's a trade-off. So is there a logic to the trade-off? Um, and I didn't feel any different working on yours than I did in other cities. That's why I sort of said sometimes you don't know for five years because the market's not there. It didn't matter. Wouldn't have mattered. Um, and, you know, and Redmond did some, you know, Redmond did a pioneer. So the first project, if it came in the door, they said, hey, we'll let your affordability be different. Now here, because you have this property here, I think the council said we don't really need a pioneer. Um, but that was like 15 years ago when Redmond did that. I think the experience is, you know, when, when, when we did Pioneer, there was nothing in our t any of the town centers on the east side. Obviously, this form of housing is happening in our centers. Um, so at this point, um, but I would also say, you never know, you might, somewhere we might have not got it right and you can go back and revisit it. But the main point is, I think that I've always communicated to cities is, if you had done that program and not put any affordability provisions in, you mean some of your attorneys working in law offices, you can't go in five years later and say, you know what, we want that now. That it's, it's very much linked to when you give the capacity, that is the time in which you need to have the conversation. That, that's the key point, is it's very critical that if you're going to link, you know, that you can't just say, I want affordability, well, you can, maybe, that's much, but if you, state law is pretty clear, it says if you're giving something in exchange for the linkage, then that's much more clear cut, more, that's more, an easier situation. So, um, so in Kirkland, they have some neighborhoods where they have it, but they don't have it in town center because that was the first neighborhood they rezoned. The development community said, oh, we can never, no, it won't work. The, the market's not there for in general. And so they said, oh, we better not do it. Well, now that they want affordability in their community, they can't go back in unless they give more. So all that height they gave in 95, 96 to go from two stories to four stories, they can't use that anymore. That's been given. That was given in 1995. Mm -hmm. So when they went to other areas like Totem Lake and they gave height and other neighborhoods where they said, we'll give you more height in exchange for affordability, they weren't comfortable doing that town center because they'd already given more height, as much height as the community was comfortable with. So that's why this one to me always has a timeliness element to it, is that if you do think it's worth looking at capacity questions in your community, then you should be looking at this question. Um, and that's where I'm not, you know, so we did it town center and that's why I keep bringing up Lake Point is because I know those conversations are starting. So that's why that's potentially timely there. So, if I may, you know, I, I'm intrigued by this too, and we've already addressed this. I know we did at the last meeting because we had a lot of market-based proposals for increasing density, which would help affordability. Uh, but I also think about what Commissioner Vanderline said when, when this came up earlier in the process, when we were more brainstorming. We've done a lot of this. We've got density incentives in our land use plan. We've got the TOD overlay. <coughs> Why, you know, and it's not happening, mm -hmm. would increasing it make it happen faster or happen to begin with? You know, have we already done what we're, you know, what would induce the <laughs> investment that we're looking for? And does it make sense to keep adding more and more density allowances? I don't know. It, it's, it, right now, it does seem a little awkward. It does, it's, if we're on a par with other cities with density incentives, why are we increasing our density incentives when those even ha haven't even taken 
haven't even had an influence. And, and when I say increase, it, it's more a matter of are there other areas, per se, yeah. that you would look at? And then at some point, I think it's probably too early, you want to revisit the ones you have in place to see if there is some fact consideration you want because, you know, you, if you don't see anything for five years, you may ask the question. Now, you may not be to that point yet because if we're getting inquiries. Um, so it's really, when we say expand, it's almost as much areas where you haven't got it explicitly in place. Are there any areas that are worth looking at or is that like, and if you don't have any areas that you would be considering that, then maybe it's a side burner type issue and it's a watch, what you do have. And, but again, I, I'm going to keep bringing up Lakeview because I worked on the original agreement some odd 15, 20 years ago. I'd hate to think that somehow it doesn't happen when it was agreed to a long time ago. And so I think there's a timeliness on that one, personally. Um, Lori, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that I think that the list of questions that you just asked is exactly a reason to put this consideration on the list. And, and that's because why, for example, these residential density incentives that we've had in place since incorporation, why are they not successful? Is there research that could be done to determine what is a successful incentive? The TOD is not in the same place. Those rules are very new, and um, it may be an issue of timing. I would have been amazed if there had been somebody in the first month. You know, that, that just is going to take some time. But we do have this other set of regulations that have been on the books for a long time that are not successful, and it makes me think, this could be an area where we could explore and see if there is something that we could tweak, um, something that we could geographically modify. I, I just feel like there's room here yeah. for exactly the questions you ask. Well, and I, as I said, I'm intrigued. Carol's intrigued. And this is, when I, when I read about this, I keep thinking of the phrase, the grand bargain. Mm -hmm. I think this is the grand bargain that Hala mm -hmm. came up with and proposed to the Seattle right. City Council, which Correct. is now trying to water it down, I guess, because they don't, they want more and more, uh, from what I've read, they don't like the proposal that was struck by Hala and they want more concessions on the part of the building community, but um, the concept is good. Right. And I agree with you, and I think other cities have done that, and, and Commissioner Mendry came in here at Citizen Comment last time, and he pretty much said, this is what I think would help, and I right. think he's right. On the other hand, we, we already kind of got it. <laughs> so, and what I was sort of listening for in your presentation was, well, what are the downsides? Why, why, what are the, the negatives to in yet increasing more density that hasn't been uh, attracted investment yet? You know, it's like we keep, I guess we can keep increasing density, but I think there's something else that's missing. If we're competitive on density already with other cities, mm -hmm. I don't think it's a density problem or an allowance problem, although I am intrigued and I do think it should be on our list. But I, what I think is what distinguishes Kenmore from those other cities that are now seeing that investment in density and housing is what we don't have that they do, which is a bigger economy, more jobs, attracting people here, and the transit access to the other job centers around the community. So we could keep making density unlimited. We'd go to the moon, I suppose, but unless we've got those other features, I don't think we're gonna attract any more investment before they do. And that's and, what really distinguishes us. And, and so, that, that's, so that's the comment I made earlier to the 90% that's market. So in other words, our programs, when we do the, have done these, aren't there to help the market per se. It's to say we want some of the market to be at a price point we think is reasonable. Now, when we do the analysis, your land's not worth as much, so we're not giving as much value. But your market rents aren't as high, so we're not asking for as much. But we I still account for it exactly the same way. We just use local data every time we do it. But so sometimes what, so what some cities, that's why I mentioned the pioneer concept in Redmond, the idea was, well, maybe for you, the first person who comes in the door will make it a little bit easier so that the market part does work a little better for you because, you know, now I think when we went through this with your council, it was sort of like, well, this got built across right. the street. So there's some demonstration of the market. Right. So... Um, so that's where I'm saying you've laid out, you're right, 
the, the market forces that make it so that the market wants to even build what you have. And that's why I'm saying sometimes it's patience. Redmond didn't see it for five years or more because the market wasn't there. That's why. So that, and you're probably, and that's what I'm saying, a lot of cities I find, they're thinking of the idea before the market's thinking of the idea. Mike, go ahead. I think you are right, or whoever was earlier, this is the grand bargain. Mm -hmm. And really what we're talking about is the city foregoing future tax revenue in order to be able to have a more balanced housing availability in the community. That's a great thing. The question is, where is the balance in there? How much is too much? How much is too much? Where are we giving up too much in tax revenue in the future? Do we end up in a situation where we're selling right. low and buying high? Uh, and I'm not sure that we're where that balance is. It doesn't. So once again, I think we've already done an awful lot. And what's enough? And I right. don't really feel comfortable so, that we have an answer to that. So your comments, Commissioner Vanderlyn, are felt like the multifamily tax exemption program. The TOD overlay is just in exchange for density, you give us some affordability. So there is no foregone revenue to the city when it's the, land, the, the ones that are on this part of the chart. The shaded out part of the chart, and we reference the MFTE, but that's listed under, that's the direct assistance, and the council that's exactly what the council said, and they said that's our purview, and we're the ones who are going to have to grapple with that. This one is about land use where there is not a direct um, revenue impact, per se, to the city. So just to clarify that. So uh, let, me, let me, if I may. Yes. Because I know, I, I, I hear you. I understand most of what you say, Arthur, but... I feel like, gee, I'm lucky I practice law in this area because I, now I can, I can understand the jargon pretty well, but I, have, I wish or I hope my colleagues do too, and I'm happy to explain if they don't to the extent I can or maybe Lori or Debbie can too. But my understanding is that most of the grand bargain proposal in Seattle is that developers can build more units per acre if they set aside X percentage of those units for affordable housing and they charge only X percent, like 80 percent of median countywide income for rent for those units. Now, if they didn't have that density increase, developers would lose money on that deal. They wouldn't get as much rent because of that requirement. In fact, the, the people who get hit hardest are the ones who inadvertently own the land and will sell it to the developers and developers will say, well, we're not going to pay that much because the city passed a law that requires me to only charge 80% of median income for this rent, so your property's not worth as much as you thought it was. Sorry, you lose, and you have to pay for the city's affordable housing policy, <laughs> which is why I object to right. no other incentive. But because <laughs> the city tells the developer, you can build X more units, which will offset right. those affordable housing concessions, you're not losing, and the former owner's not losing. Right. So the bargain breaks even, and the city doesn't even lose money because right. it's not a tax-based thing. And it's a land use incentive. Well explained. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, no, no, Instead of 15 no. units, you can build 20. Yes, so you can sell or rent that many more, and that offsets the affordable housing. No, and I, I, I understand that. That's an urban oh. planning 101. Oh, sorry. Well, what, what I, and, sorry. For being but I, Thank you for, for <laughs> where I go with this is, and I think we've seen this in some uh, larger, more mature cities, if, if that property owner had the incentive to was allowed to build to the density and not trade out a lower rent, would not the city, as a result of that, ultimately have higher tax revenue because the property would have a higher value. But because you allow them to build more units, they'll get more that rent. They'll, they'll get that tax revenue. The property would have a higher value. If you put one acre parcel and allowed two units on it, it's only worth X dollars. If you allow four units on it, it's worth two X dollars. So the city gets that much more tax revenue from the, the zoning increase without raising the tax rate. And the pe and what, who really wins? This is this is the part where we're talking about the affordability factor. Who really wins are the people who need affordable housing. And you know, there's a good neighbor award for cities who plan ahead and make provision for the people that can't afford, you know, hopefully when we do Lake Point, there'll be some 
wonderful condos that have great views that will sell or lease for more money. But not everybody's going to be able to afford to live there. So on the back side of that building, are we going to make a provision for maybe some affordable senior housing? Wouldn't that be cool? But this is the time to reconsider how are we going to incentivize the development capacity of the land we have available. At some point, the land's going to be gone, and the values of those buildings, whatever they end up being, is going is to continue to go up. And all you have to do is like go look at the history of even Seattle. Think of how sleepy Seattle was when you came here. Pretty sleepy. Pretty sleepy. And you go to Capitol Hill, and I mean, people are spending millions of dollars retrofitting those buildings that were apartments for decades into condos and selling them. Or tearing them down. Yes. And building nicer and bigger ones. But my, my question is, and I'm sorry if I No, no, it's okay. Thanks, because I want to sort of feed off that. Yeah. Is at some point, people object to a height limit. Right. I think that's what you implied during your downtown presentation. Downtown Kirkland, right, exactly. Right. They said when they get too high. Right. So that's what I'm wondering. Are, right. are we at a point already where we're high enough or as high as people tolerate because I know we talked with our with our view zones which is where most of the multifamily zoning is we don't want to so, block those and so we've been right. sensitive so, to those height limits are you thinking are so, there other places non-view places where so we so that, uh, let me in order to, to try to keep us moving forward yeah. a thought to put on the table that might help you out because um, again we're this is mostly to get him on the table and see if there's clear-cut things I'm hearing kind of intrigued but lots of questions there's lots of different angles that we've talked about that this might apply. So what might be helpful is if we could sort of put the filter on of going, okay, let's take this strategy and illustrate. So Lori mentioned, well, you had this voluntary citywide thing that nobody's using. Is that, that's one, is that worth looking, you know, that pure, just no zoning change, but if you build so much, you get extra, you can do it, and should we play around with that? The second is you've got the existing in place is that okay for now, I'm patient, or do we need to revisit any of that? The third is, are there any areas in which you are looking at capacity potentially, so there's a timeliness to those? And then the fourth would be, are there any other areas where you're not thinking about, but who knows, someday maybe, and put it on the radar in case. So we could sort of try to put sort of specific sub-bullets in here of how that might play out here in Kenmore for this one. Yeah, and I agree, and I'm intrigued, and I, I think we should explore those things. But isn't, I did want to say right. those this, are the concerns I had when you come back to right. us. Go ahead. Isn't the $64,000 question is what is going to work? What's the balance? And isn't there some some data out there that says that, you know, you Well, <laughs> this is where you'll notice a number of cities have the cities where you're seeing it done, it's essentially structured in ways where it's essentially mandatory if you're really going to do the new forms of development. If you want to do the old forms of development, that's one thing, and the odds of that happening aren't very high. And so if the new – and they make it essentially mandatory in those cases. Um, I could now go on for hours. Um, <laughs> so so that, that, so that's the only real way to make right. sure it happens, is right. what and you're saying. So, to some extent, that there, a certain amount of mandatoriness, or but a fair, it has to be fair. I mean, so that's where it gets a lot trickier, and I don't want to digress this for another half hour. On, I mean, I can come back to that more, but what we do see in studies in California where lots of cities used to have this program is when it's sort of like your citywide program, it doesn't seem to happen very often. And that's, you know, where you just sort of allow it. You know, oh, no change in zoning, but if you do a few more units. It's when you have these rezones where cities say we're really changing what's allowed and we're going to link this new product to affordability. And many make it just mandatory like Redmond and Kirkland. And some make it, well, the old rules, which are really low, you don't. But if you want to do anything that's close to the new, you're gonna, there's going to be something to go above that old, old. And, and that's what, like, Bell Red and Mercer Island and places like that have. Um, so, but there is sort of a formula. We have ways we presented it. Other people have other ways of modeling it. But, yes, in, with HALA, they did a lot of modeling over the, the trade-offs and, and stuff. So there's different kinds of trade-offs. There's ones that you mentioned where you're using, like, tax incentives 
where what are we getting versus what are we giving? And then there's others, what's fair to the builder and the landowners and everything like that, so that you're not completely undermining the basic economics of real estate development. So, but it gets. Go ahead, Mike. But I, that's I just like, want to reiterate my concern that I still don't have a sense of, again, of how much is enough right. and how mm -hmm. much have we already done. Right, okay. Uh, there is the concessions or the agreement negotiations that the city can make with property owners can be made basically once because you're right. At some point, you're just not going to have anything more to give away or that you're going to, whether it's height limits or it's community response to whatever you, you want. You can, you can trade away those height limit density so many times but really only once. And you can only try, and, but I think we have to understand what's the balance between what we want with those concessions. Affordable housing definitely is one, but cities also need parks, yes. Yes. they need playgrounds, yes. they need lots of other things that are commonly traded off to development in return for those concessions. How, how do we balance that so out? How do we know that so too now we feel like we're getting into it's a priority thing and we come back and we spend months on that. To illustrate your point, in Red Bell Red, you know, a certain amount of it goes to housing and a certain amount of that increase goes to money for parks. So you're right. There's other, there's multiple, and you don't want bad land use. The question is, is it intriguing enough that, oh, we don't have to worry about this for five years, so put it as a low priority, or is this something... And that's why I want to give you specific examples of what you would look at in this town to say, is it worth looking at all these hard questions sooner than later? So I think if, if we can give you specific examples of where that might play out, that might help you. Yes, and I also think that if we could have some idea of the relative commitment that we would either expect to make uh, okay. in, 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 in Kenmore versus what is typically done or has been done elsewhere, that would be okay. helpful to understand. Okay. How close are we to that balance line? Because just as we've all talked about before, again, Kenmore is a very small city. We have a very constrained resource here. And okay. land is the most right. constrained. So okay. again, how we trade away these concessions are going to be very important to the future of the city and the amenities that we may have out here and what will eventually, uh, what okay. the eventual look of the city will be like. So let's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sure we got the balance here, right? I hear you. And I think that's kind of what Scott was getting at, too. And okay. I remember, and I know we want to move on, but I can't help but mention now that you brought that up, city manager, Carl Lindsay, coming in here when we're rezoning the RB and saying, don't rezone, what was that zone where the where the 192 mm -hmm. is? And mm -hmm. it's along 522. I don't remember the name we gave it. But we Regional said, let's business. make it, instead of mixed use, is that where it was? And we said, let's make it multifamily. There's just no investment going on there. Let's let's try and create some more investment there. It was, no, don't do that. Because we want to have more space for commercial use to build the economy. Yeah. You know, we've only got so much, so many square feet or acres to uh, build a bigger economy, to build office space. And if it's, it's going to get built as residential before it gets built for office. So if you open that door, have we given up a potential... Uh, business. One more. So, so this is intrigue, I take it? I, I, you know, yeah, I'm intrigued. I have, we obviously, it's intriguing with lots of questions. That's where I think we are okay. on this. So, Scott, I think it, you tell me where you are. But yeah, I think so. It's okay. very interesting. Dennis? No, it's intriguing to yeah. me. I'm sort of being quiet because I really see even the devil or the saint in the detail. <laughs> yeah. And so all right. I have to do is explore it. Right. Look at it. Right. And quite frankly, there are some things that we've traded off in the past that I think we ought to look at whether we should continue that trade off. And I'm thinking more of the parking issue. Yeah. Because the residents that I know with mm -hmm. some of the developments are not very happy. Yeah. And so right. we've got to think that through a little more. I would like to. Yeah. yeah. Good question. That's good. Right. Thank you. Okay. So okay. I think Go we ahead. got a little homework on that one for you. <laughs> we'll try. Okay, um, let's jump into preservation. Um, and we have two different ideas on the table here for preserving existing housing. First one's kind of related to the previous conversation. It's a different way of providing incentives, but doing it in a way in which you're 
explicitly trying to preserve some existing housing. So if you have like a neighborhood where, or an area, and you've gotten a building that is much lower density than is allowed, potentially through the rezone, you sort of write your rezone provisions in a way that say, we'll let you sell what you're not using to someone else. So it's a wrinkle almost on what you've done with your TAD overlay. Instead of just offering affordability, it's almost like instead of offering affordability, you say, okay, you want to build more. We'll let you do it by somehow having that building not change. And that would be instead of putting in your building, so essentially you're paying almost for the right that that person's never going to use. Um, you're sort of paying for that so that that building stays what it is. And so it still reaps the general value of the zoning there, and that gets translated to somebody else who wants to build something bigger um, otherwise. So um, that's sort of a, sometimes you've done that with open space concepts where people sell their development rights to keep something as open space, and they take those development rights and they can use it to buy density in centers. So King County has a program like that where you can preserve open space outside, you know, the growth line that, or in some parts of unincorporated King County. Some cities do it internally. Redmond has a program where they had some areas, they, you know, their valley. They didn't just take away the rights of those, that land area. They said, you can sell your land, you know, development rights. We'll give you some development rights. You can't use them, but you can sell them to people in town center, and that's one way you get extra height, extra, extra height in downtown Redmond, okay? So that's one idea, is you do that where existing buildings, you motivate people to not redevelop their property. Um, then the other one is your manufactured um, housing communities. You have a couple. Um, and uh, Bothell has the most sort of pronounced way. They use zoning to say that's the allowed use for this area. Um, it's an economically viable use. That's the zoning we have. And so therefore, redevelopment if you want to redevelopment, it's going to be manufactured housing. That's the zoning. They actually create a zoning district. Um, so those are examples of things cities have done to preserve or could do to preserve existing forms of housing. If you think you have areas where that might be in the path of redevelopment and you maybe want to preserve some of that. Um, we, typically where we find that kind of housing is on the edge of planned centers. We often find in East King County that we have these garden style apartments built right around the edges of where you're planning your centers. And so they're still kind of considered the fringe area of the centers, or so they have, so sometimes the zoning includes them. Um, so, that's an, so that's where we've typically seen that kind of housing. I can't say that I've seen cities, other than what Bothell did, I, either of these I have not explicitly seen cities do. Um, I think Seattle tried to do something like this in the Denny Reed grade back in the 70s. Um, that was a way they were going to try to make it so that you couldn't get all high, that on a block you'd always have only one high rise and low rise and other parts kind of thing. So um, so I haven't seen it used very often. I've heard it talked about very often, but I haven't seen it actually implemented. Comments? So, again, it's sort of like the, the concept, the theory, I'm intrigued by, but I think I'm already thinking of some ways this might be unhelpful or a problem. So somebody, let's say we've got these trailer parks mm -hmm. in Kenmore, they're very low cost, probably at the core of our affordable housing for really the lowest income levels. Probably those are the lowest rents, I'm guessing. And I think this might apply to those kind of places to keep them there, because they'll probably be redeveloped someday if mm -hmm. they don't have other incentives to keep the current use. They get development rights, they can't use them, they can sell them to a developer who would then use those development rights where? And well, that's what? where I'm saying this would be, to do that here, you would have to probably take your existing TUD program and add another level to it, say, which is to say, and you know. Super duper do, high. No, 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 no. I'm Let's saying get that. Denser, and then more <laughs> no, dense, no, no, well, see, now. now. Now you've got, no, well, it depends. Ooh. If you only went to four and you were thinking six, maybe. Yeah. If you're like, we're where we want to be, yeah. what I'm saying is you'd go back and you'd say, a property owner can do an alternative. Yeah. And the alternative is instead of putting them in sight, if he went and bought, you know, made a deal with this property and 
made whatever transaction had to be made for them to be happy that they know they can't develop higher, we would potentially accept that. So you would have to add a whole other section to your TDOD overlay, and you might have target. You might say, we only allow that to happen with parcel X and parcel Y. You know, that you could only use that strategy there and there. Any parcel could use it, but the only ones that could be targeted for preservation would be X or Y. Kind of okay. thing. Okay? Wait. X or Y is targeted for preservation, but where did they exercise the development rights they purchased? Is that I'm saying anywhere to? in the TOD. You could, say, you could do it different ways, but I'm saying yeah. anywhere in the TOD. So instead of that TOD having to give 10% of the units at the, you know, when you did the math at 50%, say, fine. If you show us the deal you made here, we might accept that instead. Okay. And then you don't have to do any affordable on-site in your building. You, instead, you help preserve. Okay, that makes sense. I get it. Okay. Comments? Intrigue? We hit the intrigue threshold. <laughs> Carol? I'm intrigued. Carol's I mean, intrigued. Mike? Yeah, with reservations. Yeah. 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 I'm okay. with that. <laughs> Is, where, I'm it curious, sounds like, like, right. like you said, it hasn't. You haven't seen it very often. It sounds right. like a lot of work for very little potential use. Because right. we've already got all these other zoning incentives in place. It's sort of like you're reselling the same product, you know, to different people. Right. And, I mean, you <laughs> almost could fold this into the previous one of saying, and, and I would tend to agree, it's if you had some very specific things in your center area that you think are worth preserving, you know, I mean, sometimes people look at what you have and say, well, we want to account for the needs that are there, but we don't necessarily want it to be done by preserving. I don't, and so I was going to ask you where your reservations are. Is it because, well, maybe it's meeting a need, but long term, do we really want that use if we could replace it or if it's all oh, it feels logistically impossible to do? I guess for what I think about here is I find, at least off the top of my head, finding it difficult to understand where this would be useful. Okay. I could see if we were in Woodinville. And you had somebody out there who wanted, who owned some relatively rural land, or, or would make a deal to trade away their their air rights. Mm -hmm. They wanted to develop a high-end, low-density garden type of apartment, or maybe senior housing, or something that was going to be high-end. Mm -hmm. And they were, and they were willing to trade away that, and then that could be used by somebody else elsewhere in the city to create more density for affordable housing. I could see how you could make those trade-offs. I could see how you might have a community that wanted to preserve its, its character and they would trade that away. I mean, if we wanted to say, okay, Lake Point, uh, instead of going up to six stories or eight stories, uh, make it low density and we'll move that density to where? Somewhere else in the city. We just don't have that open space. Right. Or, so. So let me. You, so I'm, I'm interested in allow, seeing you allow, how that would work. I'm just right. still we allow alternative it. compliance, right? Mm -hmm. So this is m maybe, like I said, this could be a wrinkle on what you kind of already have. You allow alternative compliance. Developers can propose something. So this is sometimes where I've done too much of this stuff over the years. Where, you know, we helped acquire a manufactured housing community in Redmond. Um, cost us a lot of money to do it because it was going to be torn, to, it was going to be replaced, you know, and it was going from septic onto the sewer line and all of a sudden then you could build all kinds of stuff on it. And it cost us a lot. Now, this would probably be used in tandem where, let's say you have an apartment building in downtown, uh, in the town center area, that it's like, boy, that would be nice to preserve. Newcastle had one of those, okay? And what we were trying to negotiate on a new site where they were going to do development and they were changing the zoning, part of the deal was we'll let you, if you can help us preserve that other building, so it might be, you're not going to keep that same owner, but we often, when we're funding projects, people are buying existing properties. We just did that in Bellevue, and very, very much in the media this summer. And it cost a lot of money. If instead we could have gone when we bought that, you know, the people were supporting to go buy it, say, and developer owner, um, you can get an extra million dollars because we're going to, we had someone who wants to build more over here and he's willing, instead of putting it on site, build it. He'll give 
you a million and you'll keep the price a little lower for us so we don't need as much public subsidy. So the odds are it would be very targeted. It would only be something the city would want to make happen. And the odds are long term you're going to actually be intervening more directly to make sure it stays affordable. And it just sort of helps that whole transaction to occur. So that might just fit under the alternative compliance where you might suggest, you know, where maybe all you got to do with this concept here is to identify, this is maybe almost an informational thing like an earlier item. Hey, there are a couple things in our community that we're really sensitized to and that's going to be our next, our next to last, we're almost there, the, manu well, the manufactured housing. Are there things we can do to make their preservation work better? And maybe that's the way it's expressed at this point. There are certain property, we would, there is 200 units that we would like to try to preserve around our town center. Go make it happen however you can and, get cre and, and almost focus around that rather than the tools that might get you there. And that might be what your strategy plan says. And, and then let it be creative how you get there. Anybody else? Where are we on intrigue? <laughs> Man, go ahead, road. Mark. M middle of the road. Middle of the road. <laughs> yeah. Barely, barely intrigued. Um, I guess so. Can I ask a question? You know, this seems to fall under the category of the fact that we do have some manufactured homes in our city core, and although we don't have a plan for changing that, has there ever been a developer that's come forward and wanted to purchase that land and created conflict? Um, I think the ownership of those properties changes hands over the years. So obviously those, those existing properties obtain new owners and then it's gonna be a question of what the those new owners or different owners may want to do. Okay. Um, so I'm sure that some of the uh, owners are certainly holding onto those properties and trying to figure out when is the right time for redevelopment. Mm -hmm. um, so that could put some of those existing parks at risk in the future. Yes. Uh, for a loss of, loss, of, loss of housing. And then the other thing that we heard um, so a few council meetings ago, there were some um, tenants in, in a mobile ho senior mobile home park that attended a council meeting saying that we are now concerned is that a lot of the um, tenants down there are on fixed income and the rents are being raised by the property owner and we're being essentially priced out. The percentage of our income being used for rent is now more than we can afford. Yeah. So those are the sort of the two issues right. that we are seeing with the current housing that those property owners may be interested in redevelopment. The question is the timing of when. And the other one is is that the current tenants are saying our, our rents are going up and we can't right. afford it. Yeah, and, that. and that's where I mentioned the intervention things we've done yeah. is because maybe they don't go away, but if the market changes, they change. And we've seen that. And, and so... That's why I'm almost saying as I talk this, as I was talking about that, it's almost sort of hit me is, are there certain types? In fact, this is what now Bellevue has raised after their experience this summer, is are there properties out there that we should be trying to preserve? And, and preserve can mean one of two things, not have them be redeveloped, or it can mean keep them relatively affordable and in relatively good condition. Because they might not be, they might be affordable but not in good condition, or they might not be either of those, but if they fix them up, then the rent's going to go way up because that's what's going on. So preservation can just be saying, boy, here's some very things that have been part of our community. Remember how I said the first highest priority for ARCH the first 20 years was preserving those federally assisted properties? We've only got one left. So now it's kind of like what's the next wave of things out there that we should maybe be proactive? We identified that 20 years ago as a priority, and we just watched them. And we've done all kinds of crazy things to preserve those buildings. So that's why I sort of turned it around at the end and said, maybe what the strategy plan says is we think we have a profile of a couple different types of properties that we should look at all different kinds of strategies to see if we can preserve those condition-wise and affordability-wise. 
and, and, and that's not how we present it here, but maybe that's a twist on um, this concept of preservation. I think a lot of cities are struggling with this question right now. They're seeing it happen. They don't know quite how to handle it. And, they're, and in their strategy plans, they're struggling with how to talk about it. Yeah, it's hard. So it's 9.03, and we're pretty close to the end of this section. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we have at least enough intrigue on this to consider discussing it. Okay. And we've got two subjects, C and D. Anybody want to, do we want to push through those? I'm willing. You're willing? Any, everybody else willing? We try to, Scott, wrap things up at 9. That's why I always bring it up. When we hit 9, I give people a chance to say it's enough. I want to go home. <laughs> but it sounds like we've got enough will to try and get through the last two. And fortunately, I think C, accessory dwelling units, we've already talked about quite a bit. Okay, so if you want to make, right, and what would be to motivate your answer is if we get through this section, even though we have another section or two to do, I think that gets us through a whole body that we could go back and sort of try to come back with the next version because the next stuff is more regional stuff and monitoring. Okay. Um, and we still need to talk about those, but we'd have gotten through the lion's share of the sort of strategy ideas. Yeah. And so that would free us up to try to clean it all up, bring back some of the information and start revisiting some of these. So any objections to doing D and, I'm sorry, C and D, none? Okay. Let's do it. ADUs. So you guys anything more you want to say? Then we. I know Scott's news, so it, it's not fair to him. So are you familiar with? Yeah, I think they're a good thing, from what I know of them. But okay. My job is to give pros and cons, but I. <laughs> yeah, and we talked a little bit about that. Right, what we, are the cons right. on ADUs because we I, we did talk about a lot. Of the Mostly pros. compatibility with neighborhood yeah. is the primary one, um, <coughs> and. And then on some of these particular ones like um, grandfather provisions for existing and things like that, um, making sure you do that in the way that you're maintaining life safety. I'm just sort of throwing out sort of the, the, the con, you know, not necessarily the cons, but the, the concerns or things to watch for. Um, and let's see, that's for the clemency program. And um, I think the pros, you know, some of the other pros to clemency programs is somewhat over time, people having legal ADUs might help them. You know, banks haven't come around completely yet, but when you sell your home, you can say you have it. And, you know, things like that versus sort of having to do it under the table or, well, it's sort of okay. Um, and it also allows the city to do a life safety. So um, to make sure that people can say, yeah, if I'm doing this, it's done in a way that is safe and stuff. So, and the other, I'll just stop there and Intrigued? See. Very yes, 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 okay. mm -hmm. yes. And, and then the range, just to sort of put out there, is that there are two or three distinct levels of addressing ADUs. One is your zoning. Two is your permitting and how you code people, permit them, that process. And then the third is community awareness. Okay. okay. So those are three levels in which that issue can be addressed. Because you might find your zoning isn't that much of an issue, um, but you might find that the code people, they come in and they say, we want separate meters, which is one of the big no-nos because the cost of that will make people go, I'm not going to bother to legalize them. Plus, I always saw the separate meters as, or keeping one meter is a way to keep intact the intent of an accessory dwelling unit. It's an accessory unit. If you have separate meters, people think they have separate units, and why can't I subdivide, and why can't? Whereas the whole idea of accessory dwelling units is to allow, maybe forever, but maybe on and off, that space on a property, primary owner is still there, and let them rent out in a secondary, smaller version of a house um, to help address needs of the family and or the community. So once you do separate meters, people start thinking, I got a separate legal unit. And we keep saying, no, it's not a fully separate legal unit. And one of the best ways to protect against that is meters. Good. Okay. D? Um, D is um, expediting permits. So do you have any policies at this point that you know of? No. Nope. So on this one, it's 
someone walks in, they have a certain level of affordability proposed in their project, so you do everything you can to get the permit out the door sooner. Sometimes that means even bypassing other projects that are already in the door. So I think the pros and cons of that are pretty straightforward. Time, time is money, right? Um, holding costs. Time is probably, I would say, time is less of an issue for affordable housing developers than it is for the private market, but it is still an issue for them from a holding cost. Um, and the con is, well, if it's not working for that's happening, why don't you fix the system? And Are make it work for everybody. Permit for non affordable? Well, I'm saying, it, yeah, if you have a situation where people need to be expedited, maybe the issue is your system yeah, not, it's not very expediting. <laughs> you should fix the system for everybody. Right. Yeah. So that's the, that's the flip side of that one. My concern is I think you're putting affordable housing ahead in front of the line ahead of non affordable housing. Correct. That's Market one housing. That's, yes. So that's in disincentive for builders to build market housing in Kenmore, which is contrary to what we want. We want to increase the supply of units in the if, if city they were, to reduce the price. If they were worried that your system was so slow or whatever that it would be even slower because somebody could jump them. I, 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 I haven't heard it from that angle that, you know, what we always hear the builder saying is, why don't you just make the system work in general? Yeah, yeah well, I'm, yeah, they're not going <laughs> to split hairs, but it would be extra. Right. right. So that's one. I'm not sure. I think... I, I'm not sure how proactively, I think our cities have policies, but I'm not sure I've seen, I'd actually, if you'd want, I can go and see if any of our cities have any black and white policy or program about expediting, but I don't, I'm not sure because I think usually cities tend to go to fix the system if it's that broken. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of leaning against this one. Yeah. Okay, well that. Because it sounds like it's not that big. They, people look at it differently anyway. They don't even look at this as a way of fixing it. But, and right. so I think we'd be spending time. I'd rather spend it on other, okay. other ideas, but that's me. I would just add to that, okay. you know, one of our mottos in the city is courtesy is contagious. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the culture of our right. city is to get stuff done. Right. right. Just kind of mess okay. with that. <laughs> Three no's, Dennis. No. Fourth no. Or a question or comment? A question, and I don't know whether this goes under C or not, but as we go through this process of balancing all these needs and that we're looking at, I feel like we should pay some attention to the issue of the covenant rights that people have in their subdevelopments because we've had a couple of big lawsuits in the neighborhood over the issue of those covenants and where the city's position was, we don't care, we're not gonna enforce any covenants. And so you ended up forcing the lawsuit outside, yet we're creating a force that pushes them into lawsuits. And I don't know if it fits here, but I, I have a concern about that being raised in the future as an issue. Lori? Yeah, we we don't that. enforce private covenants. Right. That's true. We don't. Well, so if there's a private covenant on the property, we don't and we don't enforce. We don't get involved legally. We don't. It's an issue then for the homeowners. No, no, I understand that, but there is a concern that it's called private covenants, but they weren't called private when they were submitted and made covenants 50, 60 years ago or more. Yeah, because it was they were part of the subdivision. Yeah, but those are on the plat, and they have the effect of a covenant that affects all the properties on the plat. That's right. So it's just as if everybody agreed, whether they were on the plat when it was developed or whether they were created later, they're still binding only on the owners of the properties. But, but here's a situation where that could be tricky. What if the city enhances or incentivizes ADUs, but covenants in your plat say you can't have ADUs? Mm -hmm. Then you would have a situation where you'd have to have all those neighbors come together and say, hey, we want to be able to do ADUs because the city's now permitting them. I mean, I don't even know what the covenants in my neighborhood are, but, you know, I do know of some. So if they're in the covenants, we're not enforcing them. But, you know, that potentially could be a conflict. Well. I just want to make sure that we don't lose track of that as an issue right. because even though we may decide that it's a non-issue, 
right. it's going to come back potentially and bite us at some point. So it's it's not going to come back and bite you because this issue has been out there for over 25 years for me. And all cities have landed in the exact same spot, which is we're going to allow them and whether or not a private, through a private contract, which the covenants are, people make issues of it. Um, so, and I haven't, you know, when I first started doing this, this came up a lot more than it's come up in the last 10 years. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're all just doing it privately or everyone just is like, why are we even bothering to, I, I don't know why. It came up a lot the first 10 years I worked on this, not hardly at all. And, and again, I'm happy to check around with the cities that have you have them on the books. You have, right now, you already have 41 cities. Am I reading your chart right? Um, looks like you have 41 ADUs in your community now. So you allow ADUs at this point in time and have for some time. But those covenants were probably put in place when it was unincorporated King County. Right. And but it doesn't matter either way. Um, and my also my experience also is I haven't read the more is that the really old covenants like in my neighborhood don't mention it one way or the other. Okay. It became something where when covenant when people started paying more attention to them and not just the one pagers or two pagers, it's when they got longer. And I remember when I first moved here in the 90s, early 90s, and I was looking for a house and I read for it because you know I'm, I thought I have a long history with them and. I looked at a lot, and, I, and it was interesting. I told the builder, I go, your covenants won't allow me, even though the city is going to. He goes, really? He didn't even realize it. He just that when they got longer, the language in there and the ones that were done back then often didn't allow them. Um, it wasn't like a conscious. So I don't know. I, but if you'd like, we can, you know, you have your city experience, but I don't mind us checking around um, to see if any other cities are having issues with homeowners associations yeah. in general. Well, I, I like hearing that it seems to have phased out, but it right. didn't phase out well, when this other recent lawsuit occurred. Right. That's what I'm saying. Is I'm sure it's out there in places, I, I, and I'm happy for us to check around East King County and see if it's popped up anywhere else um, in those cities if they're dealing with it. I mean, can you figure out how many subdivisions have covenants? No. 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 <laughs> Not easily, but, no. But I will say, too, though, if they aren't enforced, if they've got a, a, a community um, organization that enforces those covenants and they don't do it for 20 years, then they're not enforceable anymore. Right, and that's, that's right. And that's what I'm saying is there's, there's all kinds of ranges of, quote, covenants out there and active homeowners groups and not active homeowners groups, and it's all over the map where that's played out. For non-homeowners groups, some of these are part of a subdivision that were right. filed before they had the concept. Exactly. That's, that's what I mean, right. But even without a homeowners association, an individual property owner can enforce a covenant against another one. I'm sorry? You don't need a homeowners association. Private parties who own properties that are part of a common set of covenants can enforce them independently. They can't. Right. So I'm just saying that's not the... Yeah, yeah, that no, doesn't I, I, I looked at this issue because I built my house higher than the covenant said, and I said that, that you haven't met for like 20 years. The, the, right. the last uh, president of the Homeowners Association right. came by and threatened me, and I said, yeah. when was your last meeting? They 20 left. years ago. Yeah. So, so I, and I looked at the law, and I. I'm saying apart from that. Apart from lapsing, you know, apart from a specific right. circumstances that affect it, I'm saying as a general proposition, your neighbor could enforce covenants against you if they are enforceable, if they otherwise satisfy. Right. Yeah, right. I think we need to Basic that. covenant law. I'm not sure where, where that gets us, Dennis, but I, I think what you're saying is let's not forget that. That's okay. really all I was asking. Okay. 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 Anybody else on D? No? All right. So we did it. All right. 917. Lori? I hate to say this, but I don't know where you ended up with D. Oh, oh we, I said no. Uh, Mark we were, we were said not no. Intrigued. Carol said no. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah, that was Mark shook right. his I head. Great. <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> I think Commissioner Baker put it very Jim well. Siskel over there said, don't forget the covenants. So, uh, <laughs> that was a good euphemism. Maybe you're Roger. <laughs> Doug, I have one, one thing, yes, which is um, 
City Manager asked me to remind you that about a week ago he sent out an email inviting you all to attend the Sub Suburban Cities Association dinner, which is uh, being held tomorrow evening at the Inglewood Golf Club. Uh, if anybody wants to attend that, um, you, you can, and it will be on the city's dime to pay that cost. I think um, Carol is maybe registered for that, so if there's anybody else that's interested in doing that, um, call the city tomorrow and ask to speak with Nancy Meehan, and she can make sure your uh, it's paid, taken care of. If you even have a last minute decide right before you can go there and then the city will reimburse you. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank that, you. Uh, don't, don't forget about that. There's a meal involved, is that right? There's a what? Is there a meal? <laughs> there in is the, in the picture? Food, food, there food, is food, food is involved. There you Maybe go. not a meal, but food. Sound cities, I'm sorry. Sound cities. Thank, thank you for Sound that. Sound cities. I knew. All right. And the keynote speaker is the mayor of Seattle. Is that what I read? I believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, anything else? Was there something else? Nope, that's it. Okay. Uh, well, that satisfies the agenda. Is there any new business? There being none, I hereby adjourn the meeting. <laughs>